Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Biomarine First Quarter 2022 Financial Results Conference Call. Hosting the conference call today from Biomarine is Tracy McCarty, Group Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Tracy. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. To remind you, this non-confidential presentation contains forward-looking statements about the business prospects of Biomarine Pharmaceutical, Inc., including expectations regarding Biomarine's financial performance, commercial products, and potential future products in different areas of therapeutic research and development. Results may differ materially depending on the progress of Biomarine's product programs, actions of regulatory authorities, availability of capital, future actions in the pharmaceutical market, and development by competitors. And those factors detailed in Biomarine's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, such as 10Q, 10K, and 8K reports. On this call today from Biomarin Management are J.J. Bienname, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Jeff Ager, Executive Vice President, Chief Commercial Officer, Hank Fuchs, President, Worldwide Research and Development, Greg Geyer, Executive Vice President, Chief Technical Officer, and Brian Mueller, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I will now turn the call over to our Chairman and CEO, J.J. Bienname. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So we begin uh, 2022 course for significant growth and the transition to sustainable gap profitability. Uh, interesting box logo from family seeking a treatment option that addresses the underlying cause of achondropasia has been very positive, as underscored by today's increase in 40 year 2022 box logo guidance to between 100, 100 million and $125 million. We also we affirm previously released financial guidance for all other metrics included, included in our uh, full year 2022 guidance. So we generated 519 million uh, record revenues in the first quarter, representing 11% growth year over year, excluding Cuba. This marks the start of our Marine's return to significant double digit growth. Actually, uh, the revenues for products marketed by Biomarine were up. 15%, including Kuvac. So really up to strong start and to double digit uh, revenue growth, <clears throat> hopefully over the next few years. Um, so these results uh, highlight the strength of our base business and the significant opportunity that lies ahead with Box Turbo. It is important to note that $13 million of the $20 million total for the first quarter for Box Turbo sales we are from outside the United States, emphasizing the breadth of our global footprint and commercial capabilities and the importance of the ex-US markets. This will be uh, advantageous as we prepare for the potential European launch of our Roctavian in the second half of this year, ahead of a potential US approval. With the financial outlook and, and robust global launch of Voxovo tracking to plan, we look forward to the great, uh, to the next important regulatory steps uh, with Rotelia and GZIP over the coming months. For people with severe hemophilia uh, seeking hemophilia A, seeking B control that is superior uh, to test better care for prophylaxis, we think Rotelia uh, presents an exciting uh, treatment option based on the, the results that we observe in our phase two and phase three studies. We believe these data provide supportive evidence of efficacy as part of the marketing authorization application currently under review in Europe and planned for inclusion in our ELA plan for resubmission in late June. We were also pleased to share the news today that we have completed the genomic analysis of the salivary gland mass from the participants in our phase two Rock David study, which was treated over five years ago. The findings from the completed analysis did not identify evidence that vector integration contributed to the salivary gland mass. This is great news for patients and the safety profile of Octavian and actually for the entire AV gene therapy field. And we say a few more words on this in a moment. As we look forward uh, to the remainder of 2022, <clears throat> 22, we are on our way to achieving the goals set forth at the start of the year turning uh, the corner to sustainable gap profitability, wrapping up our largest pediatric opportunity to date with Voxovo, 
and progressing routine in applications with health authorities in Europe and the United States, and also advancing the broadest per exchange pipeline in our history. We will continue to build on this financial, uh, commercial, and regulatory momentum in 2022 and beyond as we make the transition to an earnings growth story. So thank you for your continued support, and I will now turn the call over to Jeff to discuss the commercial business update. Jeff. Thank you, JJ. I'm very pleased with our performance in the first quarter of 2022, recording $519 million in total revenues. The $20 million Bossogo contributions in the first quarter drove increased Bossogo 2022 full-year guidance to between $100 million and $125 million and will be an important component of our 2022 growth story. Now, turning to specifics of the Boxogo launch, we are pleased to share that as of March 31 this year, an estimated 284 children were being treated with commercial Boxogo. This includes 201 children in countries outside of the United States and 83 children within the United States. An estimated additional 53 children were in process in the United States as of April 15. At the end of the first quarter, Boxogo sales were spread across 15 active markets, including sales in new markets not previously reported in Saudi Arabia, Slovenia, Czech Republic, United Arab Emirates, and Italy. We continue to be very pleased with uptake in the EMEA region, which has been driven by a combination of growth in Germany and collectively from individually smaller markets. Upcoming and outside of the EU, we expect potential approvals in Japan and Australia later in the year. The opportunity in Japan is expected to be significant, and we expect revenue contributions to begin there later this year. Turning to launch dynamics in the United States, we have seen prescription demand pick up quickly. We have been able to rapidly convert patient referrals to patient starts. In the quarter, we experienced prescriptions from geneticists and pediatric endocrinologists as expected. We also see more payer coverage policies published, which are largely consistent with our label or our clinical trials criteria and are aligned to our expectations. In summary, we're very pleased with the pace of uptake during this ramp year for Boxogo. Launching in the EMEA regions ahead of the United States was a first for BioMorian and underscored the ability of our experienced commercial teams to tap into large market opportunities, regardless of location. This is of particular importance as we look toward a potential Octavian launch in the coming months, should the CHMP opinion and European decision be supportive. Turning now to our enzyme replacement therapy brands, Bimazin and Maglazine both achieved record quarterly results in Q1 of 2022. Consistent with our experience last year for both brands, we fulfilled large orders during the first quarter from such markets as Turkey, Brazil, Egypt, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. This demand is gratifying and good for our business, and we expect will cause the first half of 2022 to have some concentration of our annual revenues, similar to our experience last year relative to the second half of 2022. As JJ mentioned, we reaffirm our annual guidance for Naglazine and Bimazin revenues. For Bernara, 33% growth year over year and revenue of $36 million in the first quarter was driven by 18% growth in new patients starting therapy. Moving now to Palantik, net product revenues grew 2% in the first quarter as compared to the first quarter of 2021 and were impacted by a variety of factors. In the U.S., seasonality of healthcare coverage, similar to what was experienced with Kuban in the past, resulted in a Q1 dip in Palantzik revenues as compared to the fourth quarter of 2021. And while we expect this dynamic in the U.S. to recover for the remainder of 2022, impact from ongoing PKU clinic limitations has full-year Palantzik revenues trending to the lower end of the guidance range for the full year. 
Continuing with the PKE franchise, Kuban contributed $59 million in revenues in the first quarter of 2022, down 16% as compared to Q1 2021. Since the loss of U.S. market exclusivity in October of 2020, we experienced a further step down in the U.S. in the first quarter. As Kuban nears the end of its life cycle, as we would expect from a small molecule drug, we are gratified to be able to retain the market share and resulting revenues we are experiencing. Based on market conditions, we expect for your Kuban revenues in 2022 to trend closer to the lower end of the previously provided four-year guidance range in 2022. Lastly, with the CHMP opinion on Roctavian expected in the near future, launch readiness activities continue to progress. The team is on board and well prepared to launch, assuming regulatory approvals later this year. We are encouraged that our longer-term data results offer a potentially attractive value proposition and treatment option for those with severe hemophilia A, and we look forward to providing you with more detailed updates at launch. In conclusion, in 2022, we anticipate increased demand for all of our commercial brands, with the exception of Kuban, as just described. Our NDS products are expected to contribute significantly to revenue growth this year. We also expect Boxogo to be a meaningful factor in this ramp year, as noted in today's increase in Boxogo revenue guidance. We believe that robust prescription demand represents a foundation for continued growth, including the new markets throughout 2022. Thank you for your attention, and I will now turn the call over to Hank to provide an R&D update. Hank? Thanks, Jeff, and thank you all for joining us today. The R&D organization had a very busy quarter as well. Our regulatory team has been focused on health authority interactions with the European Medicines Agency on the Roctavian application currently under review and preparations for the June resubmission of our biologics license application in the United States. We have enjoyed a high degree of collaboration with the EMA as we enter the later stages of the review procedure. Thus far, we have been able to satisfy the requests for information, putting us on track for a potential CHMP mid-year this precise scheduling is subject to the EMA. As JJ mentioned, we were pleased to have completed the analysis of the parotid gland tumor that was identified and one of our phase two study participants as noted in our EHAT presentation this past February. The results are consistent with a benign integration profile for Octavian, as we did not observe Octavian integration associated with growth of the tumor cells. We plan to provide EMA these data as part of the ongoing review of our marketing authorization application as well as include the data in the biologic licensing application in the United States in the resubmission in June. Needless to say, we're pleased with the findings, with the findings as it further supports the safety profile Roctavian has demonstrated to date. As leaders in the field of gene therapy, we look forward to sharing the results of the analysis with the scientific community at the upcoming World Federation of Hemophilia 2022 World Congress uh, and the annual American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy meeting in addition. Turning to Boxogo, we are pleased to share that Dr. Andrew Dauber will present results from his study in genetic short stature conditions at the Pediatric Endocrine Society meeting this coming Sunday, May 1. As he shared at our last R&D day, the study spanned six different genetic stature conditions, so we look forward to learning about the potential of Boxogo to positively impact children with other conditions besides achondroplasia. The next milestone with Boxogo is the data update from our Phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled Boxogo study in infants and young children up to five years of age with achondroplasia. The team has had the opportunity to analyze the results since they were unblinded in February, and we, expect, and we expect to share them at a medical meeting in the middle of the year. Finally, turning to the earlier stage pipeline, all of the candidates under development continue to advance. A new update today is that we have begun dosing patients in the Phase one 2 Harmony-1 study using BMN331, our gene therapy for hereditary angioedema. We are encouraged by this new opportunity for AHAE patients, as our preclinical data suggests that BMN331 can reduce the frequency and severity of attacks and potentially eliminate chronic therapy for some patients, significantly reducing the treatment burden of HAE uh, and the current standard of care. We're excited to begin this development journey and learn about the potential for BMN331 to restore C1 esterase inhibitor protein in humans based on the encouraging preclinical data observed. 
With the NO255, which addresses a subset of chronic renal, renal disease, we completed the single setting dose arm of the phase one two study and are in a process of analyzing results. Concerning BNN351 for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we expect to file the IND in the first half of the year with the goal of treating the first Duchenne boys in the fourth quarter of this year. Our preclinical studies of BNN349 continue to build our enthusiasm for its potential to dramatically improve liver health in people living with A1AT. B, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and BMN-293, formerly referred to as DINA-001, is on track to be our next gene therapy clinical candidate, in this case for the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy caused by mutations in cardiac myosin binding protein C3. We continue to advance 349 and 293 towards INDs in the second half of 2023. Lastly, on BMN-307 PKU gene therapy, we await the results of non-clinical studies required to remove the current clinical hold. And as we said in January, in February, we believe that this will be a multi-quarter process. So we'll update that program status when available. Look forward to keeping you apprised of our progress across the R&D, across the R&D organizations as we advance our Octavian applications, present data at upcoming medical meetings, and move the earlier stage pipeline products forward. Thanks for your support. And I'll, doubt, I'll now turn the call over to Brian to update financial results in the quarter. Brian? Thank you, Hank. Please refer to today's press release summarizing our financial results for full details on the first quarter of 2022. Since Jeff touched on many of the top line results from the commercial business, I will primarily focus on operating expenses, bottom line results, and other key financial updates this quarter. As usual, all results will be available in our upcoming Form 10-Q, which we are on track to file over the next few days. As we highlighted in February, we believe that 2022 is an exciting year for BioMarin, as the company anticipates transitioning to sustainable gap profitability driven by the continued strong growth of our base business, plus a significant contribution from Voxogo in its launch year. We are pleased to be tracking the plan based on the company's first quarter results provided today. Total revenue growth of 11% in the first quarter of 2022, as compared to the first quarter of 2021, excluding Kuvan, sets us up nicely to achieve our full meter gap and non-gap income goals in 2022. To elaborate upon one important comment from Jeff, while we expect Naglazine and Zimazim orders to be weighted to the first half of 2022, based on the ordering patterns of select markets, we expect that our total revenues for the full year will be balanced out by growth in our other brands in the second half of the year, and that total bottom line revenues will be roughly even between the first and second half of 22. Also comment on Voxogo. While we are pleased to observe the early patient uptake trends for Voxogo globally, which drove our increased expectations for the full year 2022, it's important to note that even though we expect to continue to add new Voxogo patients over the remainder of 2022, the mechanics of daily dosing mean that these new patients on therapy for just a portion of the year will contribute slightly less to full year 2022 revenue. Moving to operating expenses for the first quarter of 2022, both R&D and sg expense fell in line with our expectations. R&D expenses for the first year were $161 million, a slight increase as compared to the first quarter of 2021 reflecting increased Roctavian development efforts and increased R&D on our early stage program. SG&A expenses for the first quarter, 2022, were $195 million, as compared to $174 million for the same period last year, and reflects the global Voxogo commercial launch efforts since the European and U.S. approvals in the second half of last year, as well as the Roctavian commercial launch preparation costs. Moving to bottom line results for the first quarter, as we shared in February, during the first quarter of 2022, we sold the priority review voucher received with the approval of Voxogo in the United States. The transaction was recognized as a gain on sale of a non-financial asset on our statement of operations and was the primary driver of Q1 gap net income of $120.8 million. While gap profitability in 2022 will benefit from the CRV sale, we note that our business plan for the year and the related profitability expectations are not dependent upon the after-tax gain from the PRP sale. With respect to non-GAAP income, Q1 2022 non-GAAP income of $105 million excludes the gain on the sale of the PRV and was relatively flat to 2021 first quarter non-GAAP income of $104 million. 
and represents a strong start to our expectation of earning between $350 to $390 million of non-GAAP income this year. Turning to total cash and investments, we ended the first quarter 2022 with $1.5 billion, mostly flat to year-end 2021. While our total cash increased with the proceeds from the sale of the PRV, we also experienced quarterly working capital timing differences during Q1 2022. As we said when we provided 2022 guidance, we do expect positive operating cash flows for the full year. Briefly on the Ukraine crisis, given our global footprint and commercial presence in this region. As we previously shared, the Russian and Ukraine markets represent approximately 2 to 3% of Biomarin's total revenue. And based on what we know today, we expect that to be consistent in 2022. Given the essential nature of our products, which treat underlying conditions for which no alternative pharmaceutical treatments are available, we continue to serve our patients in the region and are working to minimize the treatment disruptions for Ukrainian patients. In fact, we have already fulfilled a significant portion of the expected 2022 supply to Ukraine and Russia. In closing, 2022 is off to a great start, and we are on track to achieve our transition to sustainable profitability with record first quarter revenues driven by a strong global launch of Rockville and solid growth in the base business. Our plan to support both continued product approvals and innovative pipeline growth while at the same time generating sustainably increasing revenue, profits, and operating cash flows is being realized with an eye towards continued growth further into this decade. Thank you for your attention, and we will now open up the call to your questions. Operator? Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Your first question comes from the line of Salvin Richter of Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First, congratulations on turning GAP profitable. Um, two questions for me. For Voxogo, in the U.S., how is outreach and uptake progressing in pediatric on endocrinologists? And then for Octavian, anything you can provide us on how regulatory discussions are playing out in the U.S.? Thank you. Hi, Salvi, and I'll take the first question. Um, yep, we're doing really well with outreach to pediatric endocrinologists. Um, it is a new call point, and um, and you know, as we're we're emerging from the shutdown, you know, our teams are establishing connections with this new call point in the United States and other uh, markets where we're we're active for example, in Germany. And uh, we're seeing prescriptions coming in from a mix of uh, physician specialties, as I noted, but mainly from geneticists and uh, pedendos, as we would expect. So I would, I would say it's going right on track with nothing, nothing notable to describe that's kind of surprising or different than we expected. Uh, and on regulatory discussions, um, again, the bulk of the conversations have been uh, with European Medicines Agency, and we feel pretty good about um, the connection between the remaining questions they have and the information that we have to provide them, including the recently completed genomic analysis of the salivary gland tumor, which is favorable. In regard to the U.S., um, we do plan to have even further discussions with the Food and Drug Administration in advance of our uh, resubmission, uh, pre-submission interaction is in fact scheduled with Food and Drug Administration, but we've also already had quite a bit of dialogue since the CRL about um, information they'll want us to provide back to them when we do resubmit. We also feel pretty good about the sufficiency of the data that we have in hand for um, satisfying the, the uh, concerns that were raised in the complete response letter. So feeling pretty good about uh, the regulatory situation in both markets. Got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from Chris Raymond of Piper Sandler. Hey, um, thanks for taking the question. Um, just on Voxogo, uh, maybe just a couple questions on the dynamic there. Um, I think with the number guys, you guys gave, about a third or so of revenue last quarter was in the U.S., and, and just a little less than a third uh, of patients. I know it's early, but is this maybe indicative of, you know, more you know, sort of parity pricing, or is there some sort of, you know, patient ad dynamic? And then also just doing the math on the 
you know, on the revenue and then the patients. That seems to be a relatively high number for the quarter. Um, just is there any um, thing you can add there in terms of the uh, you know the, the pricing dynamic? And if I can ask a pipeline question, um, no mention of uh, I, I think I heard no mention of, of BMM 307. Can you just uh, give us a sense of where that program um, sort of sits? Thank you. Hi, Chris. I'll start off on the Bonsogo question. Uh, so you mentioned and and uh, and confirming that we stated about a third of our revenues from the United States and uh, the balance XUS, which ties up pretty closely to uh, the patient numbers that we're reporting. Also, um, in the United States, early in Q1, we did have some some specialty pharmacy uh, stocking, which was a one-time event. Um, not a huge number, but, uh, but enough so that there's a resting inventory in our specialty pharmacy network. Um, that's kind of a one, as I say, a one-time event. And uh, by, by late March, I would say we were seeing uh, reorders of our specialty pharmacy network in the U.S on a consistent enough basis that you would conclude that there was no further um, buying down of that inventory and that the SPs were essentially ordering to demand. So that could be a little bit of a bump uh, in Q1 and or tilted towards the, the U.S. Um, and, and you followed along our pricing discussion. It was, as usual, we have a, a robust um, price particularly in the U.S., um, and, you know, so far we're managing a pretty tight price corridor uh, for Boxogo and other markets. Did, did that cover your question? Yeah, if I may ask me, uh, uh, so actually the launch has been going very well in both sides of the Atlantic, um, and, and, and the difference here, I mean, two aspects, the difference you see a little bit is because, you know, we started selling in, in, you know, in Germany, actually, in October of last year, so a little ahead of the U.S. We really started selling in the U.S. in January. Uh, but but basically, what's happening is that the, the revenues are commensurate to the, the market, you know, the market size. And we have always said that uh, the largest opportunity was outside the U.S. And the numbers are confirming that. And also, the good news here is that again, uh, I think there were some anxieties I've read in some in the latest reports about launching a product first in Europe and before the U.S. That's the first time we do that. And it shows actually that we can be very successful launching a product in Europe ahead of the U.S., which is likely to happen for Octavius. So all this is pretty good. So, Hank, you want to answer? Uh, yeah, three or seven, Chris. The game plan is we've got to complete some additional preclinical studies um, that pertain to the findings that had been previously reported to the agency. We were hopeful that, based on some early interactions with the agency, that we would be able to remove the hold quicker. Um, but unfortunately, with this requirement to conduct additional studies, we probably won't have any updates for you on that until we have the results of those studies, which are going to be several quarters from now. So I'd say, unfortunately, don't be looking for near-term updates on 307. Okay. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from Robin Karnaskis of Truist. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. So um, just quick one, um, I guess for the EMEA discussion and the U.S. discussion, given that you're adding this additional salivary gland um, data, you know, is it possible that we could go into July? I know you're not on the docket. It looks like for April for EMEA and same for the U.S. Do you think that this could take a little longer if the filing could be middle of the year, like July, August? Um, and then second question is on Voxogo. So, it seems like you have the same number of patients in process that you did last quarter. Do you expect this, um, the addition of patients to be consistent, or do you think this is more of a bolus up front? And then maybe you can comment on, and it's a lot, but maybe you can comment on compliance, um, given the early, and it's early, but compliance with uh, daily sub key dosing. Thanks. Uh, hi, Robin. I'm Bob Vicente. I'll take a shot at the first part of your questions as to the timeline in the European Medicines Agency. You know, we. We, um, we're feeling pretty optimistic that all the information that we said we'll be able to provide the EMA in the last leg of review uh, will enable them to make a decision in June. But, you know, it's also a decent amount of information, and the EMA has, um, uh, has uh, based on the questions that they've asked, they've requested, 
you know, a decent chunk of information for them to review in terms of risk management plans, labels, post approval commitments, and things like that. So, yeah, it could drip into July, um, uh, but we're, you know, we're working to be lined up with them and uh, enable them to come to the positive opinion. Of course, that's the objective of all this. Um, and in regard to the U.S., you're right to ask the question. My team will certainly appreciate the nature of the question, which is that they're carrying a lot of water on the European application at the same time. We're finalizing the U.S. application. So, you know, as with execution things, and it's really down to execution, yeah, sure, things may take a little longer. We really want to make sure that um, we'll submit an application that will facilitate um, you know, an effective review by the U.S. But, that target, again, is in June, and, and we, we're hopeful of remaining on that track. And we got <clears throat> your question on, on Voxogo. I mean, I'll let, I let uh, uh, Jeff answer the question of whether it's a bonus of patients or whether uh, the bonus is going to be sustainable. I believe it will be, but Jeff can elaborate. And the compliance, I think we've lost only one patient. Is that correct? All the patients we saw, it, we have lost one patient so far. Jeff. So extremely good compliance. Yeah, thanks, uh, Robin, for the question. It's actually a, a positive sign of the launch trajectory in the United States, which is the one place in the world that we're able to track uh, patient numbers in process. So um, the, the fact that, that our in-process is holding steady uh, compared to where it was a quarter ago is indicative of you know, getting a steady stream of both of new patients being enrolled and then uh, also having the ability to pretty rapidly work through those patients, uh, get them approved for treatment, get the product shipped out, and uh, first prescription fulfilled. So I view that as a positive. Related to compliance, um, JJ noted uh, a small number, very small number, <laughs> on drop-off so far. We don't have, uh, at this stage, I don't have a quantitative estimate of compliance other than the drop-off figure, which is supportive of a high rate of compliance so far. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're being very proactive with patients and their families about um, kind of training for this uh, daily injection. And we've gotten super feedback in, in both Europe and the United States that that's been really helpful for families giving them the confidence to go out and begin the daily injection uh, routine. And, and I think that bodes well for compliance going forward. Thanks. And again, summarize cool. okay. just here. <laughs> we have very good visibility, as just said, in the U.S. because patients basically first enroll kind of in the program. They, 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 they signify that they want to be, well, it's a family, that they want the, the kids to be treated with Voxogo. So, so we have a good visibility for for the, the accretion rate, uh, and we have no sign at this time that it is sort of new patients wanting to be treated, that it is slowing down. And I think, um, and, and just you want to mention how long it takes between when a patient is basically signed up and, and when we start shipping on average in the U.S.? Yeah, so, uh, so far it's pretty rapid. Our average is 23 days from uh, complete enrollment uh, with the prescription to shipment of that first prescription to a patient with some variability around that means. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from Corey Kasimov of J.P. Morgan. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking uh, my questions, too, for me as well. Uh, both probably for Hank. First, just to follow up on the, on the U.S., um, Rock KV in situations. Is there anything specific that needs to be addressed in that pre BLA meeting that hasn't been dealt with already? I guess just curious if this is standard operating procedure for a resubmission or if there are issues to still discuss. And then the second thing, I was just wondering, Hank, if you could set the stage ahead of the short stature update this weekend for Voxogo. Uh, what would be compelling in your view or uh, in an in investigator's view when you speak with them? Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I think the interaction with the FDA pre-submission last evening is more of the uh, SOP rather than necessarily particularly new information. You know, I think the uh, agency's uh, stance is likely to be, you know, these are all issues that are going to be resolved during the review. Uh, what we, it's, what's important for us to do is to make sure that we have 
uh, a clear eye view of the information that they're looking for. We have we have all these data, so it's really just a matter of making sure it's in the form and content of, of what they're looking for. So more on the SOP side. As far as the Dauber uh, presentation, you know, I think the expectation to have is that in the amalgam that uh, sort of across a range of mutations, and I think a reminder is, I think he's indicated that he's accrued patients with six different types of mutations, that there can be an improvement in stature as measured, as measured by the AGB in children who have mutations that are different from the achondroplasia FGFR3 okay. mutation. Um, and he's got a lot of biology as to why he believes that to be the case, but of course the data itself themselves will be dispositive for its, you know, his, his underlying hypothesis. So I, I would focus in on the AGB change from baseline across the different types of mutations that, that he's included. And I think, you know, the, 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 uh, the, a, good, a good outcome would be similar or better than, you know, similar to what we've seen in achondroplasia, a great outcome. Um, and it might be mutation specific, might be that some mutations are even more responsive to the serotide. So um, I think that's the stage to set for the, the coming data. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from Paul Matisse, as people. I think she said Paul Matisse at Stiefel. Um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for taking the question. Uh, good to talk to you. Um, just uh, one, one box to go question on the commercial side. Um, I guess, are, are you seeing physicians or do you think physicians will do anything to determine whether or not patients are benefiting? Um, obviously, you can look at growth, natural history, but every patient is different. You kind of can get into hypotheticals. So, Maybe just comment on how you sort of verify efficacy with this drug, and then to the extent you've seen any discontinuation so far, um, what what are the reasons, uh, if you wouldn't mind clarifying? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question, Paul. So, um, uh, in terms of tracking benefit, um, that's not something that we guide uh, specifically to, but we would certainly expect. Um, we would certainly expect physicians to be following along the progress of, of their patients. There is uh, newly published guidance on the management of achondroplasia, uh, which I think is helpful in providing those prescribers um, the guidance to do that. And uh, growth velocity and height would be, you know, kind of a lowest common denominator that could be expected. Um, some, some of the U.S. insurers are requiring uh, you know, evidence of, of benefit or renew, future renewal of prescriptions, for example, which seems reasonable enough. And um, back to the, the publication on management guidelines, you know, as you've heard me say before, um, really, there was no medical home, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, in our system, no medical home for achondroplasia patients. And I think part of the opportunity here uh, is to establish a, a medical home for kids with achondroplasia, um, up to and including, but not limited to, the use of Boxogo as a part of that overall management scheme. And I, I think that's going to be good for Biomarin and Boxogo, and it's going to be great for the kids with achondroplasia and their families. Uh, in terms of discontinuation, we don't really have enough data. As JJ mentioned, I think we have one discontinuation, and I, I don't have a, a stated reason for, for that one. Okay, thanks. And, and maybe tracking. just one... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, maybe you back to tracking the... Um, the efficacy, and this is not a scientific way to do it, but just an anecdote um, that when we tested the advertising campaign with European healthcare professionals and patients, we actually have a, we have a picture of a young uh, girl who has been treated with Boxogo for I think over four years, probably close to five now, and she's obviously what she's an achondroplastic patient. And the reactions from the panels of doctors and, 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 and families of, of take on patients but that, that we should be using we should be using really controversial patients for our advertising. But that, that's my other way to answer your questions. Thank you, JJ. And last, just one quick thing: any update on the path to uh, full approval? 
Thank you, John. Uh, not in particular, other than that, you know, the good news is that we're the data that's going to generate the full approval package is going to be <clears throat> did you follow up these patients from the pivotal clinical trial? And um, as you just heard, you know, the compliance in the program overall is pretty excellent. So we do expect to be able to provide that in a timely fashion. I don't know that we've got it to a specific submission date. Understood. Thank you, John. Your next question comes from Jenna Wang of Barclays. Thank you for taking my questions. I have two sets of questions. So the first one is regarding the Roctavian salivary gland mass integration analysis. So you saw similar pattern, but did you see any unwanted sites that show up in this analysis? And a related question uh, for your 307 PKU program, your analysis also showed integration, not tumor initiating event, but FDA still asks for data that requires several quarters of work. So what makes you confident that similar situation won't happen here to uh, Octavian? Um, and I have quickly on Voxogo question, just wondering what is the price range for the ex-US uh, different countries? And for friends, now you have uh, um, web, uh, like listing prices of 300,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, but since you expect future negotiating price will be lower, how would you book the revenue here? Uh, hi, Gina. Um, so as regards the pattern of integration, there really was nothing particularly noteworthy about the pattern of integration. And that, I think one of the keys is to compare the pattern of integration between the healthy tissue and the adjacent adjacent in the block to the tumor tissue. And uh, as has been previously described uh, for wild type AAV, recombinant vectors have a relatively low propensity to integration. And I think that's that has been foundational in um, the regulatory perspective. Uh, you might remember there was an FDA guidance document on this, and they referred to AAV vectors as having a low propensity for integration. And I think one of the great things about what we found so far is that it appears that the recombinant vector is behaving similarly in terms of distribution integration patterns and frequencies and um, sites of integration similar to the wild type. That is to say, not finding preferential hotspots of particular relevance. Um, and so uh, the, the next part of your question was, the 307, um, how does that read effectively? I, mean, I understood the question to be, how does it read on the 270 evaluation and why not imagine that there can be the similar requirements for 270 as there have been for, uh, as there appear to be for 307? I think the short answer to that is because the 270 vector has cleared its safety studies uh, to the adequate satisfaction of health authorities to date. Um, there have been uh, the only uh, sort of suspicious signal that's arisen in the 270 program is what we just talked about, which was the product tumor, and there's nothing unique, uh, particularly in the findings in this individual. Um, and so I think having not seen this with neither, neither preclinically the Roctavian itself, nor with a vector that whose construction is very, very similar to Roctavian and studied for a longer period of time, even than Roctavian's been studied, that similar vector similarly is not oncogenic and preclinical species. So I think all these things take together, taken together uh, both quite well for the Octavian uh, overall risk-benefit evaluation, namely that in uh, preclinical studies and in humans, um, no particular confirming signal of oncogenic potential of the vector is existing. And clearly the FDA is seeing this, uh, uh, two uh, products very differently in this respect because uh, although, you know, 307 is on clinical hold, uh, Rotavian is not on clinical hold. We are rolling issues in studies as we see. Nor is DMN331 either also enrolling, and, you know, therefore I think it, the agency is reacting to this as it's a vector-specific indication-specific decision. And you had a question on the on the revenue, I mean, price range of Boxo in Europe and revenue recognition. Maybe we start with Jeff and then Brian. Okay, um, regarding the price range, Gina, the, the prices uh, that we're anchoring to, we've got the WAC price in the United States, and on our approval call, we guided to our expectation of, uh, kind of gross or WAC price to net realizable price per, per patient. Uh, I think that's a pretty solid estimate. 
We've got the list price, um, as you note, in, in Germany and France. And um, our expectation is that it, it's going to take about a year from in product introduction uh, to get to kind of negotiated uh, um, pr uh, prices for full reimbursement. So that will happen later this year. And in the meantime, where we're establishing pricing for our name patient uh, sales markets um, are, are right in a, a pretty tight corridor consistent with the U.S., French, and German pricing. And I'll let Brian cover the, the uh, discount piece. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the question, Gina. This is Brian. There, there's nothing materially unique to speak about with respect to Boxogo gross to net, our, our experience and our expectations are that the overall gross to net will be similar to our other products, as well as our prior launches. You know, not to get into each of the European country by country dynamics, but in, in some cases you, you do start with an initial price and then there could be a clawback when you get to that final negotiated price if it's lower, but, but we're required under GAP to, to make estimates of those and record those reserves, if you will. So what you're, what you're seeing in our reported revenues would be the net net revenue. Thank you. Very helpful. Your next question comes from Jeff Nietzsche of Bank of America. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for the question. I just had a couple along kind of the same themes as everyone has been asking. Um, Hank on Roctavian, I, I know it's parsing the language a, a bit, but it is the shift from 2Q to mid 2022 from the CHMP, is that just the normal fluctuation or, or was in fact there uh, an impact to the review clock when you look at the, the tumor analysis? Uh, and then on Voxogo, you know, commercially, I know it's early, but are there some themes and new patient starts in Europe, you know, who, who weren't in the clinical studies in terms of um, you know, patient flows or awareness. I'm just trying to get a sense for, you know, what was working there this early in the launch and maybe if, if that could be similar or different uh, when you look to the U.S. launch. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, on the uh, earlier, um, you know, there's no uh, concrete um, piece of information that is uh, underneath the shift uh, the, the the minor, you know, I was talking about it being June, maybe shifting into you know into the summer. I think the um, the, the 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 only news here is, or that's not even news, is we've been off accel we we just came off accelerated assessment, and and that was anticipated. But you never know at the beginning of the procedure or even in the middle of the procedure is just sort of how their timelines line up and when they want to receive information, and um, and so I think you know as much as anything. We're just being a, you know, a little abundant uh, caution here in terms of predict, projecting timelines because they're not entirely in our control as a result of the fact that we're giving them a pretty big slug of data uh, towards the tail end of the review. They, you know, they obviously knew it was coming, so that's why we're confident we're going to stay in the procedure and that we're going to have an opinion by the summer. But it also is like you've got to follow their lead in terms of exactly when they're going to take it to an opinion. I think the most important thing is we believe that we have the information that addresses the questions that they've issued to us. And based on those questions, we believe that a positive benefit risk opinion can come, but that happens after they've done their meetings with behind closed doors. So that's what we're working to support. Yeah, so um, Jeff, what I would what I would say about themes uh, is diversity of experience here. Um, uh, with which points kind of away from common uh, themes in, in an important way. Uh, diversity, I would say diversity of age group that we're seeing starting therapy. Uh, one example, diversity of um, uh, prescriber specialty that we're seeing, mainly genetics and pediatric endocrinologists, but also some uh, pediatric orthopedists and uh, pediatricians showing up here, and also kind of uh, uh, diversity of approach. So in, in Germany, we were essentially operating uh, under a full price of reimbursement approval. Even though we haven't negotiated a final price there, it's kind of how the market behaves. And so we're seeing pretty rapid uptake. In uh, France, uh, in contrast, 
we're currently operating under a very structured uh, uh, expanded access protocol there. Um, so it's a more kind of structured approach to getting patients started and from a, a relatively small network of clinics. And in France, as I've noted before, the physicians there are actually starting older patients and working down in age um, on the logic that they want to take full advantage of the uh, window, window for treatment with their older kids. Um, that's not really something that we've seen anywhere else. And in the smaller name patient sales markets, I, I would say the theme there is you know, we're getting one or a couple of patients approved initially uh, under name patient sales approvals, and our opportunity there has been to kind of build off that, get the third, the fourth, in some cases the fifth or the eighth patient treated, and we're working hard to do that. So a lot of diversity, actually, of experience. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, guys. The next question, we have Phil Nito with Cowan. Good afternoon. Let me add my congratulations on a productive quarter. Just a couple follow-ups from us on Voxogo and Roctavian. First, on Voxogo, Jeff, I think um, on the approval call you identified one of the challenges of the U.S. launch um, that a lot of patients weren't in expert centers. Are the expert centers reporting that patients are inquiring about being treated, or um, is there a general flux of patients towards the expert centers with the availability of Voxogo? And then second, um, on Rectavian, Hank, just, just briefly, what are your expectations for an ADCOM? Uh, I know there wasn't one in the first review. Do you think the FDA is likely to hold an ADCOM uh, to review the Rectavian resubmission? Thanks. So, uh, so I'll start on the Voxogo experience in the United States. You're right. When we um, uh, On the approval call, I noted that longer term, our big task uh, was to establish a referral network um, and kind of get patients out of the random uh, physician, which is not a medical home for achondroplasia, get them referred either to a genetics clinic uh, that's interested in achondroplasia or to a pediatric endocrinologist. And, and moments ago, I mentioned that that's an opportunity to create a uh, treatment home for achondroplasia. Um, and, and also earlier I said, you know, we've, we've got a pretty steady uh, rate of patients coming in in the United States for referrals and an in-process group, and, and that's a good signal indicating that we didn't just have a bolus of patients that, that wore off and, and is slowing down over time. However, underneath that, I think you're right, um, a lot of our early patients we're coming from the uh, genetics and skeletal dysplasia clinics, expert centers that had achondroplasia patients lined up. Um, so a lot of interest in referrals early on from that channel. And in the last couple of months, then we've been able to get that referral network uh, established in the U.S. and start driving patients from a random physician that they're being seen by to pediatric endocrinologists, so that's picking up now, and that, I think that's going to be the longer-term driver of growth for the U.S. market. On the issue of ANCOM, so I don't know that I have like meaningfully more information to add to dialogue since the agency won't really decide the ANCOM until they're in review. I, I mean, I, I think if you were to ask Hank personally, what would he say? It would be something like, well, the agency calls ad comes generally for two purposes. One is when they want to approve something and they want to rally the troops around the decision they make, and then the other is when they want to kill something and they want to use the ad con to kill it. feels like, you know, uh, there's like not a lot of info that they could show to an ad con to kill it because the efficacy profile is good, the safety profile is good, and, um, and, and so what would you point to to be the motives for killing it? So I guess Hank would say, I hope they do call an ad con because I hope that what they – are doing is going to be serious about like how they, they regulate gene therapy products and use a fairly robust package of Octavian to establish standards for review. But we'll That's know when we're in. Yep. That's helpful. Thank you. Your next question is from Matthew Harrison of Morgan Stanley. Um, great. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Jeff, I just wanted to follow up on two things. One, I, I think you talked about 
some inventory dynamics that helped Botsogo this quarter at the specialty pharmacies. Could, could you, be, or maybe you're willing to just quantify or give us some sense about how much that helped. And then secondly, just as you're preparing for Roctavian in Europe, can you give us some sense of how much work has been done so far and how much engagement you've had with each of the countries around, or if any engagement around um, price and, 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 and just sort of initial commentary there? Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt, for the question. So uh, back on Boxogo and the U.S. and kind of a, a resting specialty pharmacy inventory, um, you know, you could judge from the mix of revenue, ex-U.S. and U.S., and say, well, uh, Bymorin is guiding the $7 million of revenue was U.S. I also said that uh, by, by March, uh, we were seeing orders that uh, indicated to me that um, that specialty pharmacies were not drawing down uh, that resting inventory. We also know specialty pharmacies don't like to hold a lot of uh, inventory, and and really they don't have to because we've got really good uh, reorder dynamics for them. So um, I might I might guide to a couple to several million dollars of resting inventory in the United States, and then uh, with respect to Rockavian in Europe. You know, one of the things that I, I think the Voxogo launch in Europe is doing is validating that uh, where there is a large market opportunity and you have an experienced company with experienced teams that know what they're doing, um, we can capitalize on that market opportunity and have successful launches um, in the EU in particular. We're leveraging all of the experience that we've gotten from the past launches um, as in the United States, we formed specialized uh, teams to prepare for Rockpedian, including um, seeding our teams with people with significant experience in the hemophilia business. Um, we're, we're essentially ready to go in, particularly in the markets where we're expecting first revenues. And you might expect from the current and past experience that would be in places like uh, France and Germany and Italy first, and in places where we get main patient sales uptake on a relatively rapid basis. So we've got people in those places. Yes, we've been doing uh, price research. Um, we have an active, active program working with um, market access uh, advisors in, in Europe. We followed that practice, for example, with, with Voxoga. We're doing the same thing with Rockavian. I, I'd say we're really ready for this uh, launch, and we're excited about it if we get a CHMP positive opinion and an EC approval here. I, I may add a few things. We, so in Germany, at least the launch grid is being a price, you know, close to the U.S. Fed price, over around $2 million. And we also have uh, done a lot of reimbursement research there's major interest by German payers about outcome-based agreements, uh, and we will be uh, making those available because now we have great data showing that, uh, you know, the majority of the patients do respond very well to Rotavian, and very few of them, you know, low single digits are uh, either not responding or go back to uh, prophylactic factory therapies after a few years, so we can we can maximize the price at launch by basically offering a guarantee of success to the payers. And that's something that they understand very well and they are very interested in, uh, considering that they, uh, they know how much the species are costing them. So uh, that's kind of the plan. Your next question comes from Joseph Schwartz with SVB Securities. Hi, um, a lot of my questions have been answered, so I'll ask some things about your uh, mid-stage pipeline. I, I guess it's been over a year since the IND was filed for BMN 255, so I was wondering if you could give us an update on this program. I see you completed the SAD work and are analyzing that. Do you think you'll be advancing to the MAD portion, and when can we expect to see some data there? Is it possible to see a signal from the MAD trial, even though these are healthy volunteers? 
I get all good questions. You know, the early stages of small molecule de development are the sort of uh, um, oftentimes the, is the twistiest part of the road. So um, I think all I can share with you now is, is that uh, is what you you know put in your question, which is we completed the single ascending dose portion of the study and um, uh, and uh, we're analyzing the results of that. I think the excitement for 255 is its genetic enablement, namely that. Uh, we understand there to be a molecular pathway that's key to regulating oxalate excretion. And, you know, there's a lot of oxalate excretion in recurrent stone corners or people with chronic renal disease. So if we really figured out a way to open the cap on oxalate, it should be uh, excretion. Um, it should be, or I should say close the cap. It should be um, exciting for patients. But uh, stay tuned as we gather uh, data in this particular twisty phase of the development program. Okay, thank you. Your next question is from Sabjit Chattopadhyay with Guggenheim. Hey, thank you for letting me in. So just on Boxer Go, um, on the commercial loan so far, upper age limit of patients who are currently getting prescribed. And number two, um, any clarity on the sleep apnea signal noted in the younger subjects in the zero to five year old study? And finally, are you planning to advance the long acting version into the clinic? Thanks so much. Hi, Jed. Uh, I'll start with the question on the age range. Um, as noted earlier, um, I've seen we've seen where we have the data to measure it. Uh, quite a lot of diversity um, in age range, including uh, teenagers being in, enrolled for treatment, as well as uh, younger kids. So um, don't have a uh, ceiling on age, but what we know is that you know, kids that have um, uh, their their bone plates closed will not benefit. So we would expect that upper uh, limit to be something plus or minus uh, or 18 years old plus or minus. And um, I think the, your second question was related to the zero to five year olds. Sorry. And they're all acting. Yeah, so biggest possible picture on the zero to five year old is that um, uh, in Europe, or the first territory we launched, uh, Europeans were compelled by the overall package of data and the sentinel data that we provided to them during the application review. And I think we talked about that. Um, in the United that means we have a label for two. We have a label and we can sell a product for, two to, for the two to five year old population. In the United States, the uh, FDA. Uh, wanted a little bit more information, and the results of 206 are going to inform that. We've announced the uh, uh, positive trends were observed, and I think in the uh, in the treatment of these young children, I think the next step, therefore, is to have conversations with Food and Drug Administration about uh, labeling requirements. And we're going to pursue a similar pattern uh, throughout the rest of the world. We believe that the data support giving families a treatment option for children who are under five years of age with uh, achondroplasia. Uh, and working with health authorities to provide them the information that they need to, to come to that decision. And different geographies may come to that decision at different time points based on uh, emerging data. So I'd say stay tuned for further updates from us on both regulatory plans as well as overall plans for uh, um, addressing. And, and we are in the second stage of, uh, of uh, review in Japan for our petition that, you know, uh, the finding is for, you know, for zero, I mean, for inhibitions from birth to post exposure. Um, so, and also, you want to say a few words about when the so data will be presented? Uh, yes, yeah, so the data will be presented, I think we said it's summer on the call or mm -hmm. middle of the year. Um, and then I think you also asked about long acting. And, you know, long acting, um, I think so far, thought about it as not much of an efficacy advantage in most children, not much of a safety advantage. We talked about all the numbers behind all that. Um, but, you know, it is an interesting question as it pertains to the children who are under five. Um, you might know that Ascendus has, in their phase two study, enrolled some patients who are under five, so there could be some data about the effect of long acting on overall growth. But, again, a key reminder about that is how far behind us Ascendus really is in terms of its development path, but this is a relatively small phase two study. So I think we have some uh, room to both offer this option on a global basis for young children, because there is nothing else, and time is of the essence, as well as to further iterate our product offerings to continue building strength in the Voxogo brand. 
Thank you. Good luck. Your, your next question is from Joel Beatty with Baird. Thanks for taking the questions. The first one is for Vaxogo. What's the level of awareness of the drug among patients with achondroplasia and their families? And then also for 351 for DMD, um, what will be learned from the initial study starting later this year? Maybe I'll start with the question about level of awareness. Um, that's something that we would typically be uh, market researching um, to get a quantitative estimate following launch. And the, the, um, the, the answer on that one is we haven't yet gone out to market re research that question. We will at some point uh, during the year, and we'll have to wait until we do that work to have an estimate. Uh, qualitatively, um, I would say uh, looks to be pretty high based on uh, the level of uh, patients that we see coming in for for treatment. Uh, and as regards what we'll learn from the initial 351 study, as I said, our our our, our goal is to get into the treatment of DMV boys as quickly as we can, hopefully by the end of the year. Now, of course, that's always subject to regulatory review of an IND. Um, uh, but assuming that that's the plan, I think, and that should be the plan, because the essential question really is, uh, what's the relationship between a delivered dose, its safety profile, and the level of dystrophin uh, increase that you can achieve? And, you know, based on the biology of, of the compound that we've developed, um, we believe that the, the nature of the chemistry being so similar to what we use with drysoperson that we should be able to achieve tissue concentrations, muscular tissue concentrations of our 351 compound that would produce skipping in the range of between 20 and 40 percent, meaning that the patients would have uh, 20 or 40 percent of this shortened dystrophin protein, which is you know, pretty high relative to what ambulatory patients with a far less severe condition called Becker's dystrophy, uh, muscular dystrophy, have. So uh, as quickly as possible, the initial 351 proof of concept study will gear itself towards demonstrating safe improvement of a, of a meaningful quantity of, of dystrophin protein in muscle. Can't give you a timeline specifically for when those data will be available as we're just getting started. Thank you. Your next question is from Luca Isi with RBC Capital. Well, great. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, quick one on Valrox. Um, I know you're ruling out AAV as the potential cause of the salivary gland cancer, but can you actually share the integration frequency that you have observed on the surgical piece? I know Unicure mentioned in the past 0.027% of their cell showing evidence of AAV integrations for their uh, hepatocellular carcinoma case. So just wondering how your number compares to that number. And maybe also related, I think Ask Bio and Bayer reported a case of tonsil cancer in their hemophilia B program. So wondering if you know how you're thinking about read through for your program. And then still on Val Rocks, assuming it does get approved, can you remind us what's the latest thinking on pricing strategy? And feel free to dichotomize the answer between the US and the EU, should that make sense? Thanks so much. Uh, I, I'd say specifically as regards numbers, come to the presentations that are coming around the corner at both uh, WFH and ASGCT. Um, the way I think about it is that what we've seen so far is consistent with what's been previously described as low propensity for integration. Uh, so, uh, you know, qualitatively anyway, that's the frame to take into your review of those presentations. Um, as regards, you know, the occurrence of other tumors, I mean, I do think that over time there are going to be uh, patients developing cancer. I mean, that's just a fact of getting older in life. And I think that uh, what we've seen to date doesn't really suggest that there's any particular like, clustering um, uh, of, of tumor types. I think also one has to really consider sort of vector at a time. Uh, that's kind of what we've learned in our 307 journey, as we were talking about earlier, that is to say, uh, the agency is proceeding with 331 and 270 enrolling clinical trials. It's only 307 in which this question is kind of raised. So instead of sort of lumping everything together, I think the agency is taking each vector in each clinical situation sort of on its own face for the time being. Uh, I think the data that we're talking about today are pretty 
encouraging as regards to reaffirming what we've known all along about AAV, relatively low propensity for integration, relatively low uh, specificity for integration events in uh, particular spots in the genome, uh, and no reason to believe fundamentally that what's been observed with AAV it's not, you know, people run around talking about the cancer risk of hepatitis C or hepatitis B. You know, AAV is not the thing that people are running around talking about systemic cancer risks from. So I think that low propensity inform of, of integration corroboration that we're talking about today is really a powerful finding. Jason, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I mean, I think we, just, um, we covered already the previous question of pricing in, US, in, uh, sorry, in Europe. I don't think we need to go over that again, but uh, you want to say a few words about the U.S. pricing, Jeff? Yeah, so, um, you know, what, what you heard J.J. say publicly a couple of years ago was probably not less than $2 million at WAC, probably not more than $3 million, um, but that's the range that the ICER uh, first review um, that showed Roctavian to be a dominant choice at a presumed price of $2.5 million. Um, kind of worked up. Um, we'll announce a final price when we get an approval and, and launch, but I think generally those ranges um, look pretty solid uh, to me. Maybe just one other comment on, on pricing and our ability to capture a premium price. JJ mentioned outcomes-based agreement uh, earlier. That's crucial to our ability to capture value for Rockvivian. Payers, um, in addition to wanting their patients to do well, uh, to not bleed, to not have to infuse two and a half times a week on, on average, uh, payers are concerned financially about their risk of, um, of non-performance following administration and the risk of um, durability of effect over time. Uh, the data that we have so far would suggest risk of non-performance following uh, administration is very, very low. And uh, the durability data that we've seen, both out of the 201 study and the Generate 1 study, um, including the 17 patients that, that we have three years at, is really encouraging uh, about the durability of effect over time. So we think that we can largely take uh, those risks off the table for payers. And what, that's one of the, the factors that will allow us to capture at high value uh, initially. Thank you. This concludes the Q&A session. I will now hand it over to JJ Banami for closing remarks. So thank you, operator, and thank you uh, all for joining us today. We are again pleased to begin 2022 with a uh, record first quarter results. Uh, the addition of Oxogo to our commercial portfolio is definitely an important component of our growth story going forward, and it paves the way for gap profitability, uh, sustainable gap profitability beginning this year. We have successfully transitioned our focus to the development of and commercialization of genetic therapies for larger genetic conditions, and we are hopeful that 2020 will be the year that uh, the Roncalian uh, will be approved in the U.S. and Europe, and we, we look forward to uh, hoping you, uh, sorry, to keep you apprised of our progress over the coming weeks and months. So thank you all for your continued support, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you soon. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may not have